One might object that this evidence is drawn from outdated reports. But what about the recent discoveries in Africa that seem to clearly establish the evolution of humans from ape-like creatures over the past three million years? In 1978, at Laetoli, Kenya, an expedition headed by Mary Leakey discovered fossil footprints dated 3.7 million years old. Here is a contour map of one of the prints. Many scientists who have studied the prints declare they are indistinguishable from those of modern man. This three-dimensional image was generated from the contour map just seen. Could this print have been made by a human being? To most scientists, the answer is no. Instead, the Laetoli footprints are taken as evidence that Australopithecus had feet like modern humans. Indeed, Australopithecus is said to have been fully human below its ape-like head. But some scientists have come up with quite a different picture. The hand bones of the Australopithecines suggest to anatomical experts, such as C.E. Oxnard, that they were well adapted to moving in trees in a manner similar to the modern orangutan. Let's compare the blue silhouette of the Australopithecus hand with the green silhouette of the hand of the orangutan. The finger bones are strongly curved in both hands. Let's now compare the Australopithecus hand with that of the chimpanzee in brown. The chimp's finger bones are somewhat straighter. Finally, we compare the Australopithecus hand to that of Homo sapiens in purple. The human finger bones are even straighter. Hominoids with curved finger bones, such as orangutans, are very active in trees, whereas human beings with straight finger bones are not. This suggests that Australopithecus was well adapted to life in trees. The hip bone of the Australopithecin Lucy, now thought to be at the very root of the lineage leading to man, has often been described as nearly human in form. This is also true of the Sterkfontein pelvis, also from the Australopithecus, shown here along with the human pelvis. Note the similarity of the upper parts, the iliac blades. But if we look at these bones in an orientation in which the hip sockets are visible, we see that the iliac blades are set at very different angles. Comparing the Sterkfontein pelvic bone with that of the chimpanzee, we see in this orientation that both bones look quite similar and are both different from the human pelvis. In frontal orientation, the Australopithecus and ape bones look quite dissimilar. The tentative conclusion is that the Australopithecus pelvis shares both strongly ape-like and strongly human-like features. Now, let's turn to the mathematical analysis of bones. Measuring different parts of the bone, one can represent its shape as a point in a multi-dimensional space. Here, two measurements of a human thigh bone define a corresponding point in two dimensions. Relations between bones of different species can be studied by comparing the corresponding points in multi-dimensional space. Let's consider a study by C.E. Oxnard on the ankle bones of various hominids. Here is the ankle bone of a modern human, and that of an Australopithecin, namely Lucy. The distances between the spheres represent the amount of difference between the ankle bones of humans, in yellow, apes, in green, and Australopithecins, in purple. Curiously, the blue sphere representing the orangutan lies among the Australopithecines, which are distinct from both modern man and African apes, and not intermediate between them. Some have said that Australopithecines are intermediate between African apes and men, but this analysis shows them to be in a domain of their own with structural affinities with orangutans. G.P. Reitmere performed a multivariate study of metacarpal bones from the hands of humans, apes, and Australopithecus. His study showed that Australopithecus metacarpal, purple, is not intermediate between that of humans, yellow, and African apes, green, but is morphologically unique. 
Like Australopithecus, Homo habilis is shown in both scientific studies and popular presentations as having an ape-like head and a human body. This picture is redrawn from an original painting by J. Matterns in National Geographic. According to the studies we have considered, this is a misrepresentation of the evidence. This is confirmed by a recent discovery in Olduvai Gorge in Kenya of the first associated head and limb bones of Homo habilis. Here is what Homo habilis is thought to look like on the basis of the new find, and Australopithecus may have appeared even more ape-like. In view of this, certain human-like thigh bones, once attributed to Homo habilis, must now belong to some other creature. These are at least 1.8 million years old. Could it be that these were actually human? This might also be true in this very ancient and human-like upper arm bone found in Kanapoi, Kenya. In view of the great difference between Australopithecus and modern man, what kind of being could have possessed this arm bone four to five million years ago? Could it have been the same being that made the human-like footprints in Latoli? Overall, the evidence does not appear to support the view that Australopithecines were human ancestors intermediate between the African apes and man. It is more likely that they were unique creatures, rather different from both apes and men, but with some tree-climbing adaptations reminiscent of orangutans. A careful review of the modern African evidence reveals nothing that detracts from the picture of great human antiquity presented in the first part of this film, and even provides some directly supportive evidence in the form of human-like footprints and fossil bones. But a great controversy exists in the interpretation of this fragmentary African evidence. The more intently one studies it, the more it seems like trying to perceive a desired image in a flickering mirage of possibilities. The origin of man's cultural traits is perhaps even more difficult to account for than his physical attributes. This led Alfred Russell Wallace to doubt the standard conception of human evolution. Born in England in 1823, Wallace shared with Darwin credit for the theory of evolution by natural selection. Wallace could not explain by natural selection how people living in simple tribal societies acquired intellectual capacities as great as those of learned Englishmen of his time. Wallace arrived at a heretical conclusion, guided evolution. He postulated the existence of subtle beings capable of intelligently directing the evolutionary process. Darwin was aghast. He wrote to Wallace that by propounding such notions, he had literally murdered their common child, the theory of evolution. But years later in South Africa, a similar heresy was propounded. Dr. Robert Broom, who made many of the most important South African Australopithecus discoveries, also concluded that there was a hierarchy of subtle intelligent beings guiding the process of evolution. In light of the questions that troubled Wallace, consider the following strange story. According to current thinking, culture remained at a very crude level for two million years. Even with the rise of fully modern man 40,000 years ago, culture remained primitive. Then, about 7,000 years ago, a radical transformation is said to have occurred. In the space of a few centuries, civilizations sprang into being with the creation of elaborate economic and legal systems, architecture, fine arts, and numerous technological innovations. In our own times, we find that such developments are due to people with strong inborn creative talents. The apparently independent appearance of civilization in many parts of the world suggests that such creative drives are an innate feature of Homo sapiens. But how did these talents arise, and why were they unexpressed for at least 35,000 years after the time of the Cro-Magnon man? 
Surprisingly, we find evidence that civilization may not be so recent. The evidence for human antiquity discussed so far has all been published in scientific journals. But now, we shall cross the boundaries of science and enter the domain of general human testimony. According to this newspaper from the 1890s, Mrs. S. W. Culp found a gold chain within a lump of coal. This coal is dated by the Geological Survey of Illinois as being from 260 to 320 million years old. In 1897, miners at the Lehigh Coal Mine in Iowa found a stone engraved with identical bas-relief heads. The coal in this mine dates from the Carboniferous period, some 280 to 360 million years ago, during which time amphibians were thought to be the most advanced vertebrae life form. In 1862, the LaSalle Press reported that in Macoupin County, Illinois, 90 feet beneath the ground, below two feet of slate rock on a coal bed, the bones of a man were found. The Geological Survey of Illinois dated this coal to the Carboniferous period. The human bones would thus be about 300 million years old. In 1912, Frank J. Kenwood found an iron pot embedded in a lump of coal at the Municipal Electric Power Plant in Thomas, Oklahoma. The coal came from the Wilburton Mines in Oklahoma and is dated by the Oklahoma Geological Survey to the Carboniferous period. In June 1852, Scientific American carried an article about an exquisitely fashioned metallic vase blasted from a solid rock in Dorchester, Massachusetts. The U.S. Geological Survey reports that this rock is pre-Cambrian in age, over 600 million years old. Such discoveries continue to be made. In 1968, several metallic tubes were found in a Cretaceous chalk bed in northern France. The discoverers, Drouet and Sulfati, thought them to be the product of human work. The Cretaceous lies between the Mesozoic period and dates from 65 to 140 million years ago. This evidence so radically violates current scientific conceptions that it's hard to make sense out of it at all. But we may gain greater insight by considering another area in which human nature violates standard scientific views, the domain of the paranormal. Although most scientists reject paranormal phenomena, others have carefully investigated them. One was Sir William Crookes, the famous British physicist who invented the cathode ray tube now used in television screens. Crookes became president of the prestigious Royal Society and eventually received a Nobel Prize for his discovery of thallium. Crookes began his investigations in order to expose fraudulent psychics but then became convinced of the reality of psychic phenomena. One of the psychics he tested was Daniel Dunglass Holm, a medium famous among European aristocrats and literati for the remarkable, unexplained physical effects that occurred regularly in his presence. With this apparatus, Crooks demonstrated that Holm could, by touching his fingers lightly on a matchbox positioned here, caused the scale at the other end of the board to register six pounds of pressure. With a mechanical disadvantage of about 20, Holm would have had to exert some 120 pounds of pressure to do this, according to standard physics. And more extraordinary experiments were to follow. People had often observed an accordion play complex tunes while Holm held it with only one hand, away from the keyboard. To ensure that Holm was not in fact manipulating the instrument by sleight of hand, Crooks constructed a special cage. When positioned beneath the table, the cage made it impossible for Holm to touch the instrument with his other hand. As a safeguard against a trick mechanism in the accordion, Crooks supplied a brand new accordion never seen by Holm. Crooks reported that the accordion played as usual. Then, Holm removed his hand from the cage. 
Cook stated, I and two of the others present saw the accordion distinctly floating about inside the cage with no visible support. Wallace reported a similar experience. On several occasions, observers, including crooks, saw Holm levitate. When Holm levitated, he claimed he was not doing it by his own power, but was being lifted by invisible, sentient beings. Levitation by professional magicians requires an elaborate apparatus concealed upon a stage. Whereas the levitations by home took place in the midst of crowds of guests in private residences where he was a dinner guest. We find well-attested reports of levitation from a variety of times and places. For example, in 17th century Italy, St. Joseph of Cupertino often floated into the air, a phenomenon witnessed by Pope Urban VIII, the Spanish ambassador to the papal court, and the Duke of Brunswick, a Lutheran. About these phenomena, Professor Chalice of Cambridge University said, the testimony has been so abundant that either the facts must be admitted to be such as they are reported, or the possibility of certifying facts by human testimony must be given up. Anomalous facts connected with the paranormal and the high antiquity of man tend to be rejected by the scientific community. This reveals the working of a knowledge filter by which people preserve information compatible with their views and eliminate information at odds with their views. Science has carefully filtered out all information connected with the paranormal. But if we survey human society in general, we find abundant evidence that such phenomena have occurred in almost all times and places. Very widespread is shamanism. In trance, shamans contact spirits, enabling them to produce varieties of paranormal phenomena, including psychic healing. A fundamental element of shamanism and of many other traditions, ancient and modern, is that there is a soul that is distinct from the physical body and which can travel outside of it. Some evidence for this comes from modern medical science. Physicians encounter reports of out-of-body experiences. These typically occur during heart attacks and other traumatic experiences. Many people reported observing their own body from a vantage point above it. Dr. Michael Sabom, initially skeptical of such experiences, sought to confirm them. He requested heart attack patients reporting out-of-body experiences to give details of their exact medical treatment during the time they were unconscious. In the group that he studied, enough people correctly related details of their treatment to convince Sabam that the out-of-body experiences had indeed occurred. Sabam questioned, and we quote, could the mind which splits apart from the physical brain be, in essence, the soul which continues to exist after the final bodily death, according to some religious doctrines? As I see it, this is the ultimate question that has been raised by reports of near-death experiences. This leads us to the question of transmigration, the transferal of a conscious entity from one physical body to another at the time of death. Dr. Ian Stevenson, a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia, has extensively compiled reports indicating people are able to remember previous lives. Stevenson studied reports by very young children not under hypnosis with neither the motive nor the ability to invent elaborate past life stories. The reports of the previous incarnation often included details of the person's habits, belongings, and acquaintances. In many cases, Stevenson was able to verify the details and confirm that the previous personality did, in fact, exist. As of 1988, Stevenson had tabulated 2,500 cases from around the world. 881 of these were thoroughly investigated, and Stevenson was able to verify the reported previous incarnation in 546 instances, about 62% of the total cases investigated. 
Such extensive evidence suggests that the human personality can function outside the physical body and even transmigrate from one body to another. This indicates that some elements of human existence are incompatible with physical science and its evolutionary theories. Such elements leave no record in the Earth's strata. Some insist, however, that all paranormal phenomena have been the result of illusion and cheating. Nonetheless, spirits, levitation, miraculous healing, out-of-body experiences, and transmigration have been consistently observed in human societies all over the world for thousands of years. Critics argue that the human mind everywhere generates similar delusions. But if the human mind is everywhere the same, the power to discriminate between reality and illusion should also be widespread. Must we assume that the most intelligent people in nearly all cultures have been utterly deluded? According to many human traditions, living beings can be organized into a hierarchy. Here, a medieval Christian picture shows the sensory world at the bottom, then the celestial and intellectual realms inhabited by various kinds of angels, and finally, the eternal spiritual domain of God. The same idea of a progression of ever more subtle inhabited realms is also a part of Eastern thought. In the esoteric teachings of the Jewish Kabbalah, we find a similar idea of a hierarchy of emanations from God. On the lowest levels of such hierarchies are found the realms of ghosts and earthbound spirits. Many psychic phenomena are attributed to beings of this sort. Above the ghostly spirits, there are found various kinds of more powerful intermediate beings. Beyond these are found the demigods who have control over the forces of nature. Also found here are great souls who work for the enlightenment of all living beings. Why have people accepted the existence of beings in this hierarchy such as demigods? One primary reason is that people have achieved definite results by worshiping such beings. For example, at Lourdes in France, physicians have reported hundreds of miraculous cures of diseased and deformed people who have bathed in the waters of the spring connected with an appearance of the Virgin Mary. Francois Masseret, a French carpenter, had an extreme case of varicose veins for 30 years and was declared incurable by three physicians. One evening, he applied compresses with Lourdes water to his legs. When he awoke the next morning, he found hardly a trace of the varicose veins. In such cases, the restoration of damaged tissues seems to be brought about by an intelligent agency operating outside known physical laws. This is relevant to the question of our origins. If an agency can restructure the human body, it may have constructed it in the first place at any time in geological history. This may account for the manufacturers of our anomalous stone tools and artifacts which seem to keep popping up in time frames far too old for accepted evolutionary theory. But archaeology reveals nothing about living entities above humans in the universal hierarchy. And evolutionary theory requires us to regard the very idea of such beings as an aberration of the evolving brain. But this view can be sustained only by ignoring vast areas of human experience. These would include perceptions of a supreme creator at the root of the universal hierarchy of beings. Plato presented the idea of the supreme good, the ultimate absolute cause, embodying within itself eternal ideal forms. He further postulated a demiurge, a subordinate creator who generates the material domain by manifesting copies of these eternal forms. Turning to a completely different culture, we find that almost all Australian Aboriginal tribes believe in a high god, sometimes called Baimi or Boonjil. This high god is absolutely supreme and alone is creator and preserver. The Chinese have traditionally worshipped ancestral spirits, as well as a hierarchy of demigods, such as the goddess of mercy. 
The Chinese believed in a wide variety of intermediate beings, including the celestial dragons. The Chinese also worshipped Shang-Ti, the supreme ruler in heaven whose name appears on this tablet in the imperial temple complex in Peking. The Chinese emperor would perform sacrifices to Shang-Ti in order to ensure good crops. The American Indian shaman, Black Elk, became a spiritual leader after experiencing a vision in which he was transported into the presence of guardian ancestors from whom he received instructions. Black Elk saw all living beings as the children of one supreme spirit. The spiritual tradition of India, embodied in the books of the Vedas, is characterized by many as polytheistic. But in its pure form, it is strongly monotheistic. The supreme lord of the universe, Jagannath, is worshipped in this famous temple in Puri. Beyond this material world, the Vedas teach, there lies the Brahma Jodi, the effulgence of the supreme. And still higher, one encounters a variety of spiritual planets. These are predominated by Goloka Vrindavan, the abode of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna and his eternal consort Radha. In hierarchies described in the world's spiritual traditions, we find a common pattern. This common pattern is delineated in detail within the highly developed spiritual philosophy of India. The Vedic scriptures, such as Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, describe the Supreme Absolute Personality. He is the source of an eternal spiritual realm, as well as innumerable temporary material universes inhabited by souls who have fallen into illusion. Each universe is brought into manifest form by a demiurge, Lord Brahma. Brahma generates material bodies for the illusion souls, beginning with the great sages and demigods. From the demigods and sages, the bodies of lesser beings, including humans, animals, and plants, are generated by descent with modification. This can be called inverse evolution. The modification occurs quickly in a manner reminiscent of the rapid reconstruction of the tissues seen at Lourdes. In inverse evolution, an existing subtle form systematically manifests a gross physical form. This may be contrasted with the generation by generation accumulation of slight bodily changes postulated by Darwinian evolutionists. The question remains, when did human beings actually arrive on Earth? The ancient Sumerians and Babylonians held that their first kings descended to earth from heaven and that civilization was given to man by the demigods. According to the Bhagavad Gita, about 120 million years ago, Lord Krishna spoke the Gita's message to the sun god Vivishvan in his residence on the sun. Vivishvan then repeated these instructions to his son Manu, the father of mankind. About two million years ago, Manu passed the same instructions to his son, Ikshvaku, who founded the dynasty of earthly kings. Beings from the sun may have traveled by means of a Vimana, or a Vedic space vehicle, although they were capable of more direct means of travel. Such beings were the progenitors of man, and also the engineers of the natural environment of the earth. Given this scheme, humans may have been created many times by such demigod progenitors. Indeed, the archaeological evidence we've considered suggests that human beings may have repeatedly populated the earth and manifested typical cultural traits over a course of tens of millions of years.
Furthermore, the psychical and anthropological material we reviewed shows that humanity may be part of a much larger interplanetary system of life with its ultimate source in an eternal transcendental dimension. This view allows one to accommodate the totality of archaeological and anthropological evidence available to science within a systematic framework. On the other hand, Darwinian evolution requires one to kick out vast quantities of archaeological evidence and to dismiss all paranormal and spiritual phenomena as illusory. Of course, by its very nature, the evidence available to science does not give certain knowledge about man's distant past and ultimate origin. So it may profit us to consider higher dimensions of human experience rather than confine ourselves to seeking answers to these questions in bones and stones found in the depths of the earth. <laughs>